The space-time manifold is one of the most abstract concepts in modern physics, and consequently, it tends to be among the most frequently misrepresented. For instance, you're probably accustomed to being told that our reality is a sort of merged continuum, featuring three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, and whose intrinsic geometry is responsible for the gravitational force. However, this isn't actually the case, because it turns out there's no time dimension in the space-time manifold whatsoever, but rather only another dimension of space. That's right, in relativity, your space-time manifold isn't a four-dimensional space-time manifold at all. It's actually a four-dimensional space-space manifold. What? Now, how do we know this? Well, just look at the units. The x, y, and z axes of our manifold, being our spatial dimensions, all have units of distance. And this fourth axis of the manifold here is, oh, not t, but ct. Well, c is a velocity, and t has units of time, and a velocity times a time equals distance. Huh. Interesting. Now, it's often convention to drop the C from the picture and just label this axis as T. However, this doesn't mean that this axis is being converted into a temporal dimension. Rather, that we're simply choosing new units wherein the velocity value of C is set to 1. That is, one spatial unit per time unit. Which means that the resultant unit is always still a unit of distance. And there you have it. The fourth dimension of our space-time manifold isn't a temporal dimension at all. It's another dimension of space. But the space of what, exactly? Well, let's take a closer look. Now, if we start by examining the first three spatial dimensions of the space-time manifold, then indeed we see that each of these dimensions represents the space of something. In particular, this x dimension represents the space of a measuring rod laid along that direction, while similarly the y and z dimensions represent the space of a measuring rod laid out along those respective directions. Now, the fourth dimension is also a spatial dimension, meaning that this dimension must likewise correspond to the space of a measuring rod. But what measuring rod? With our three dimensions of space already filled out, where the heck is this extra measuring rod supposed to go? Is there perhaps some missing fourth dimension? Well, the clue again comes from our units. This fourth measure of space is determined by ct, or the velocity of light times some amount of time. Meaning the amount of space described here is precisely that which is traversed by a light beam over some given time interval. But what light beam? Traveling where? A light beam can do a lot of things, propagate in different directions, reflect here and there, etc. So where does this fourth rod, spanning this traversed distance, actually end up? Well, that goes between two ends of a given light clock, carried by you, the observer. That is, you place the tail of the rod at the point in space where the light beam leaves the first end of the clock, and place the tip of the rod at the point in space where the light beam meets the second end of the clock. And that is the space of your fourth dimension. Now, as time goes on, the light beam continues to deflect back and forth between ends of your light clock. So you have to keep laying down more and more rods. Meaning the space of your fourth dimension, although it grows in magnitude over time, always remains confined to the same region. And while these growing number of rods can be used to represent passing time for the observer, the fourth dimension of the space-time continuum cannot be said to be an interval of time itself. 
Rather, we should most precisely say that this dimension is the amount of distance traversed by a light beam locally confined to some small region between specified elements of matter that are co-moving with an observer. Now, why is this distinction important? Well, firstly, given the high number of different complex and delineable concepts at play here, reducing them all into a single concept, such as that of time itself, could certainly be construed as an act of scientific illiteracy. But moreover, when we examine the particular physical elements involved in defining this fourth dimension, we'll begin to get the sense that the mathematical structures which invoke it, such as the Lorentz transformations or the space-time manifold, aren't really telling us about the behavior of space or time itself, but rather are telling us about the behavior of light and its interactions with matter and space in different physical situations. For instance, you've probably heard of the trading time for space interpretation of relativity. This is wherein, because light travels at a constant velocity through space, a light clock which is also in motion through space will take longer to tick, since the light has a further distance to travel. Thus, an observer traveling with that light clock will therefore have to wait longer to lay down their next rod as compared to an observer at rest. I.e., they are sacrificing the physical progression of the ticking of their light clock for motion through space. The magnitude of their fourth dimension thus grows at a different rate than that of an observer at rest. And it's via this difference that information about the behavior of light within their moving frame, namely its causal speed of propagation relative to them, is encoded. Now, while we're often accustomed to thinking of dimensions as physical things that we somehow exist inside of, this isn't what dimensions actually are, at least not mathematically. For instance, given a cube, we can always define something like, say, an extra color dimension or temperature dimension upon it. That is, at any location in the cube, we can assign a fourth number domain spanning color or temperature values, which taken in conjunction with the three dimensions of the cube itself, forms a data structure meeting the definition of a four-dimensional manifold. We could even, under certain circumstances, define abstract notions of distance and curvature upon this manifold, just as we do with the space-time manifold. Similarly, our space-time manifold is not anything physical, but instead merely a sophisticated data structure whose fourth dimension most pertinently gives us a measure of how an observer's motion through space affects the causal propagation of light within their reference frame. Now, understanding this point is extraordinarily crucial for several reasons. Firstly, it allows us to evade the numerous confusions that arise in relativity as a result of conflating an observer's psychological subjective experience of time with actual, objective, or ontological time. But secondly, more importantly, it also gives us a crucial window of insight into the true, physical meaning of space-time curvature. Indeed, as we already know, a light beam has to travel more distance if locally confined to a light clock which is in motion relative to space. But this space which the light is in motion relative to is not the relational space of Einstein's measuring rods, which themselves may or may not be in motion, but rather the physical space through which light itself actually propagates as a wave. We thus have a correlation between the slowed ticking of a clock and the velocity of that clock through this physical space.
Now, a crucial aspect of space-time curvature relates to how clocks which are stationary further down in a gravitational field will tick more slowly than clocks which are higher up. Hence, by applying the aforementioned reasoning, we can therefore logically deduce that clocks lower down in a gravitational field are traveling at a higher velocity through this physical space than clocks which are further up. But of course, how can two clocks be traveling at different speeds through space? If they are both stationary with respect to one another and to a central mass? Well, answering this question is going to lead us back to a theory which we initially explored merely as an analogy, but which we will soon return to in full ontological earnest, the theory known as flowing space, or the river model. For indeed, the math always tells us a story, but to understand which story is the right one, you have to pay very, very close attention. So stay tuned, because this has been Dialect, and our next act is just over the horizon. Now, in the meantime, if you'd like to give it a go of learning the math of general relativity on your own, we have multiple playlists and hours of content on the subject, which you might find worth your time. So check out the links in the description below, and see you soon.